So um, my name is Catherine and I have recently finished my PhD from the University of Aberdeen and I now work as an energy researcher um, at the University College Dublin and today I'm going to be discussing some of my PhD research which looks at projecting the carbon dioxide emissions from hydrogen transport from sort of today to 2050 to see if we can meet our net zero target. Um, but before I begin my presentation, I just wanted to stress that this research was sort of done pre-COVID and pre-Brexit. So there are some things that we'll need to consider going forward. So I've included a slide at the end about um, what the implications of COVID are likely to be within this context. So I thought I'd begin with some background information. And I'm sure many of you know, um, the UK has set the ambitious target for net zero emission reductions by 2050. And to meet this target, the focus needs to be placed on two of the leading greenhouse gas emission sectors. So transport and energy, which contributed to 28 and 23% of total greenhouse gas emissions respectively in 2018. Now to do this, um, EU policy has focused on reducing the tailpipe emissions of conventionally fueled transport. And one of the ways in which we can reduce these emissions is through the banning and phasing out of all new petrol and diesel internal combustion engine vehicles from 2030. And as well as other transport types have also begun to be um, sort of phased out. So, for example, um, there's aiming to be no diesel only trains by 2040. Um, and with this with this phasing out period, a lot this sort of leaves room in the market to integrate other low emission transport types such as um, electric and hydrogen alternatives. Now, I guess the focus of my research was to sort of discuss what level of emission reduction would be observed and actually how will this impact this the environment in terms of infrastructure and carbon dioxide emission tr um, trade offs. So a common way for researchers to approach this question is to actually understand the impact on the environment through a framework called of ecosystem services and natural capital. Now, natural capital refers to the living and non-living components um, of the ecosystem other than the people and the, uh, what they manufacture and um, what they contribute to the generation of goods and services for the value of people. Um, alternatively, ecosystem services are the conditions and the processes of ecosystems that generate or help to generate the benefits for the people. So to make that um, easier to understand, an example would be forests are a component of the natural capital, whilst climate regulation or timber might be the ecosystem service that it provides. Now, um, as you can tell with that sort of definition, natural capital and ecosystem services are linked. and um, if an ecosystem service is used at an unsustainable rate, the stocks of natural capital which provide them may be depleted, and thus sort of negatively impacting the environment. Therefore, we need to consider assessing energy demand and its subsequent footprints, um, because these are going to be key parameters to understand what impact low carbon transport is going to have on the environment, and what are the trade-offs going to be between these um, factors. And to, to understand um, the impact that this is going to have. We also need to understand um, how current transport is being used and why it's being used. So back in 2018, 808 billion passenger kilometres were travelled in the UK. And of this, 83% of these passenger kilometres were made by cars, vans and taxis. Um, and there was only around 8.3 billion passenger journeys made on public transport um, sort of in 2018 compared to sort of the previous years. And um, compared to previous years, actually the number of rail journeys has actually increased, um, increasing from increasing by 170% from 1960, and um, local bus services actually decreased by 62% compared to the 1960s with 4.8 billion passenger journeys. However, when it comes to buses, there's actually pockets across the UK where there's an increase or sort of a sort of a maintain maintenance of um, sort of usage, for example, in London, where they've got a really good bus network already. So people are sort of encouraged to use buses. So they, those levels maintained, but these are sort of values for the whole of the UK. So taking that into consideration, around a quarter of all trips were made for leisure purposes. And that includes trips to visit friends, sports, holidays. And again, this was also pre-COVID. Um, and around 18% of trips were made for commuting or business purposes. So if we're thinking about how people travel, 
um, for various recent reasons, we can then begin to think about what transport would best fit those needs. For example, over half, so about 57% of travel was actually made by rail for commuting and business purposes. So that's one of the ways um, that that transport type fits in with an individual's lifestyle and how we can encourage that further. Um, so now we sort of understand that, where does hydrogen and electric transport, maybe we're talking about hydrogen here, sort of fit into the transport network as a whole? So these slides sort of give you an overview of the conventional fuel, so the petrol or diesel version of the transport type, so for cars, buses and trains from 2020 to 2050. The transport type is the pink line and 95% of the 1990 baseline, so net zero is the black dotted line for these transport types. So as you can see that when we take into consideration technological advancements, none of these transport types are going to meet their net zero targets. So this is where we need to think about how we can integrate low emission alternatives because otherwise we're really going to struggle to meet this target. So my research looked at utilizing four different national grid scenarios for these projections going forwards. Um, the two degree scenario reflects the UK adhering to the global ambition to restrict global temperature rise to below the two degrees Celsius target. So the two degree target basically is um, if we're going to meet the Paris Agreement, our values need to be below this target. The steady progression target looks at making predictions that are current with our continual rates of decarbonisation. So it's basically we're looking at the two degree target, but we're just doing things a wee bit slower. The community renewables target looks at um, communities and businesses sort of taking things into their own hands and what they can do themselves. So they've begun to install small scale renewable generation in their homes and offices and neighbourhoods. So what they're doing personally. And the consumer evolution scenario looks at the shift towards local generation and cons increased consumer engagement. However, again, this is at much slower late rate, so this is largely from 2040. So these are the four scenarios I've used to make my projections going forward when we're coming to talk about um, emissions from hydrogen transport. Um, and I've just included this slide here, which looks at the current, or from last year, from 2019, sorry, the UK's electricity generation mix by type. So um, as you can see, coal generation, uh, gas, get, sorry, gas takes up almost 40% of the current electricity generation type um, with renewables, including solar, sort of making up about a third themselves. So in order to sort of see a reduced um, impact on the environment in terms of hydrogen transport, we'll need to consider how we can decarbonize the transport network because although um, hydrogen and electric transport can be considered net zero, actually understanding how the electricity used to generate these types, uh, this type of hydrogen will actually determine how um, the emission level, how high the emission levels are going to be, because um, if you don't take this into consideration, the environmental benefits will actually become negated. So it's kind of been discussed pri previously, but there's sort of several different methods of hydrogen generation um, used or to make hydrogen. And um, a majority of hydrogen is actually made using natural gas and coal. I think it's about 95% um, using these sort of processes. Um, and my research is focused on use, generating hydrogen from electrolysis. So this involves splitting water using electricity to make hydrogen and oxygen. So as I said, if the process to make electricity is unsustainable, then it's going to impact how hydrogen is generated because I, I sort of consider it as sort of a two step process. So I sort of focused on um, the hydrogen from electricity from the grid and then sort of green hydrogen from renewables and nuclear power um, going forward. So I'm now going to talk a bit about hydrogen buses and then I'll talk a bit about um, hydrogen trains and then I'll sort of discuss um, the challenges that we need to overcome to see if these are going to be integrated into the transport network. So currently electric, uh, electric buses are actually more popular than hydrogen buses, um, but they're actually being integrated at sort of across the UK and sort of, as both other speakers have mentioned, in sort of pockets and sort of trial runs. Um, I'm sure many of you know they're sort of integrated into Aberdeen um, and we, I think it was um, the start of the year, um, we've we got our sort of uh, double-decker hydrogen buses and I think last week they had 
sort of the achievement of reaching 100,000 kilometers in Aberdeen, which was the equivalent of taking about 42 cars off the road within a year. So that was really great. They've also begun to introduce them in London with um, London's uh, mayor sort of announcing that by 2037, all of the 9,200 buses that they have in London are expected to be zero emission. And they've also begun to introduce them in other places like Liverpool and I think Brighton as well um, across the UK. But why do we actually need hydrogen buses? Well, this slide looks and compares the projected emissions between conventionally fueled buses, so your petrol and diesel buses, and cars in the UK. So the, the, the complete straight lines are the buses and the dash lines are cars. Um, and we've also looked at them at different capacities. And what we can tell is that a full capacity bus emissions so a full capacity would be um, 80 passengers on a bus and four passengers on a car. And at full capacity, bus emissions were 1.8 times lower than cars per person. So that sort of highlights the fact that we need to encourage people to use public transport, um, especially because um, when we sort of delve into it a bit deeper, the average occupancy rate for a personal vehicle is about 1.6 people per um, trip. So the average car journey only has 1.6 people in the car. Therefore, when we compare it to a 50% capacity for buses, which are the red lines, we can see that a bus at 50% capacity, so 20 people, um, still produces much uh, less emissions than um, a car at two people. So this highlights again the need for um, a low carbon alternative bus system, because although the bus emissions already are lower, we need to think about this going forward. So this slide looks at the carbon dioxide emissions for hydrogen buses using the four different scenarios I talked about earlier. And using the four different scenarios, the results do indicate that we're unlikely to meet our net zero targets, which is the black line along the bottom, even when we're taking into consideration technological advancements and when we're looking at the two degree scenario. So hydrogen has still got a long way to go if we we're gonna actually meet our transport needs. However, as I've sort of highlighted, actually the emission levels from hydrogen buses are much less than the um, emissions from cars so if we can encourage this transition over then we're likely to reduce our emission levels this slide looks at the different capacity of the hydrogen buses so looking at 100 percent capacity so your 80 passengers 75 percent capacity 50 percent capacity and then your 25 percent capacity and as you can i just put this in here to sort of show that per person emission levels decrease as the capacity increases, again, highlighting the need to encourage um, a transition towards low emission transport. Um, as I mentioned at the start, there was multiple ways to actually generate hydrogen. And I did a quick analysis just using the 2018 data. So looking at natural gas using steam methane reform and using gold gas gold classification using steam methane reform. And as you can see that the emission levels um, using this is actually much higher than would be through electrolysis. So we need to think about how we generate hydrogen because that will um, be a sort of play a significant role in how emission levels um, will affect the production. I've also included um, within the red box, the emission levels using these methods of generation with and without, with the introduction of carbon capture and storage. Now I know that that's going to be um, next month's sort of session, but carbon capture and storage is the process where they you can capture capture sort of um, carbon dioxide emissions and sort of store them underground. So if, when we introduce something like carbon capture and storage, emission levels are actually significantly less. So that's something that we need to think about going forward as well. Um, now I'm going to quickly talk about rail projections. So. I'm sure many of you sort of know that rail is often sort of seen as sort of the green mode of transport because it only actually contributes to about 2% of total UK emissions. Um, and as I mentioned at the start of my presentation, diesel only trains are going to be phased out from 2040, which will actually have a significant impact within the UK because as current uh, as of now, almost a third of the current trains um, have uh, the right infrastructure, which means 60% of the rail network is not yet electrified. And without improvements to the current rail rolling stock, as well as the tracks and platforms, emission levels could remain static. And therefore we need to consider investing into new trains and electric infrastructure, because we need to be able to offer real alternatives to private vehicles and electric vehicles, 
um, and to support the broader objectives of an integrated transport network to meet net zero. And I'm sure many of you know, or have seen in the news, I think it was last week or the week before, um, France announced that if you can travel on train, that's for, I think it was two, two and a half hours, two hours um, to your destination, then they're actually going to remove that internal flight because they want to encourage much more sustainable transport methods. Now, hydrogen trains aren't actually integrated in the UK yet, um, but they're being tested and they're already commercially operational in Germany and um, they're also again being tested in the Netherlands. Um, so this slide here sort of looks at the projected um, trains um, going forward between 2017 and 2050 um, from conventionally fueled trains, your petrol and diesel, urban, regional and intercity and high speed trains. Again, I'm not focused on the numbers here. What I wanted to highlight was that even with you take into the technological improvements, um, none of these trains will meet the 95% baseline, so your net zero target. So we actually do need to shift towards um, alternative transport types if we're going to meet our net zero targets, because currently we're not going to be able to do that based on the transport, um, based on the current trains that we have. So this slide sort of compares um, the four different scenarios with the rail emissions. And as you can see, again, hydrogen emissions are, none of them fall below that black line. So we're gonna struggle to meet our net zero um, equivalent targets um, in terms of hydrogen rail. So we need to think about how this is gonna impact um, the environment moving forward. Um, again, I've just stuck this slide in here, which basically just looks at steam methane reforms and the other types of hydrogen generation for the different rail types and um, natural gas and coal, gas and coal gasification actually produce higher levels of emissions than um, the alternatives without electrolysis. And if we introduce carbon capture and storage, again, emission levels are much lower. And that's what we need to think about going forward is if we can integrate other methods um, such as CCS whilst we're making that transition towards um, more sustainable methods of electricity generation. Um, I just wanted to have a quick overview of some of the environmental impacts that we need to consider if we're going to integrate hydrogen going forward. Um, so um, when, so I've, I've chosen these two graphs because they show the installed generating capacity required for electric hydrogen um, cars, buses and trains based on the current electricity generation, so based on the two degree scenario that I talked about earlier um, between 2050 and 20, uh, 2020 and 2050. And um, as you can see that I'm, I'm not, again, I'm not worried about the numbers, but what I wanted to compare was actually the amount of electricity or the installed generating capacity required to basically have 100% um, hydrogen transport is much higher than electric transport. And again, if we look at the area, um, total area, so once we've estimated the total amount of electricity, when we translate that into how much um, solar panels and offshore and onshore wind that would be, and gas power stations and nuclear power stations, actually, again, the total land area would be significantly higher for hydrogen transport than electric transport if everything was to be 100% of those transport types. And it works out that electric transport would require about 2% of current UK land area, which is about the same as um, arable farming in the UK with hydrogen almost needing three times that amount. Um, but actually, when you think about it in the long term, there's some things that actually hydrogen can bring to the table that actually might make integration worth it and why we might actually need a combination of hydrogen and electric transport. So I'm going to quickly talk about the challenges for low carbon integration. So I guess the biggest challenge just now would be the cost. Buses themselves for hydrogen, new hydrogen buses, the ones that were introduced in Aberdeen, are around 500,000 um, per bus, which is almost double the price of, an inter of a conventionally fueled bus. So in order to see the integration, there needs to be that sort of incent um, incentivization for, the, for introducing hydrogen transport. And that's not even taking into consideration the infrastructure that will be required. Um, now, Paul mentioned it earlier, um, it's not actually as large a sum as, you know, some you would expect, but it's still a substantial impact that will need to be to consider going forward. We also need to think about um, the tidal and wind electricity and how we can um, generate that and if it can actually be stored to help um, 
reduce the impact on the grid. So producing hydrogen during not off peak times so that it can be stored and then used during on peak times to sort of reduce that impact. And if we can consider doing things like integration renewables with the low carbon infrastructure, for example, charging facilities, having solar panels on the roof to sort of maximize um, the environmental um, impact in terms of reducing uh, land area, because that's going to be quite a key challenge. Um, and then I was also want to consider how we actually encourage people to use buses. Now, one of the things that I think is important to consider is although the hydrogen buses have produced significantly higher um, levels of emissions, as we've seen, than sort of other, well, not significantly, but um, higher levels of emissions than electric transport, however, significantly less than your conventionally fueled alternatives, it's likely that a combination of electric and hydrogen buses will be needed and trains going forward because um, hydrogen has a much larger range than electric transport. So actually that reduces the range anxiety and some of the um, challenges that uh, electric transport faces, which would sort of reduce that and sort of encourage the uptake. So it might be something that is sort of becomes um, much more obvious, especially in rural areas. And I guess why the hydrogen buses have been quite successful in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire, because they're being able to trans um, travel much larger distances than the electric alternatives, which is why the electric um, alternatives work so well in places like London. And I also wanted to sort of highlight one of the key challenges would be emission levels and carbon capture and storage. Again, it will be discussed in the sort of session next week and uh, next month sorry but it's although it doesn't directly reduce the emissions from transport it could be seen as an important um tool to help mitigate emissions produced from transport um and helping reduce that uh, my second last slide um i guess is something i wanted to consider which i think is a very topical issue just now is sort of the post covid 19 challenges um although transport emissions have decreased since the beginning of the lockdown period um, they've begun to rise again and energy and emissions from low carbon public transport were lower than internal combustion engine vehicles and battery electric vehicles. So we need to consider, we need to encourage people to use low carbon public transport as an alternative to their own personal vehicles. However, with COVID and individuals and offices beginning to open up again, um, people who are maybe getting the bus five days a week into work are now maybe only getting the bus um, and are only needing to want to work maybe one or two days a week, are going to choose a transport type that's cost um, more cost and convenient um, friendly. So they're more likely to choose their personal vehicle. So I guess the key challenge is how can we encourage people who are using buses to get back onto buses? And then on top of that, how do we actually get people back up to use public transport? Um, both sort of key ch challenges that we're going to need to sort of face going forward. And uh, this is sort of my final slide with some sort of sort of key take home messages that technological improvements cannot solely be relied upon to reduce emissions as we've seen with conventionally fueled cars, buses and trains, and we need low carbon alternatives. Um, to meet the net zero emission reductions, we need to switch to electric and hydrogen buses and trains, and it's likely to be a combination of both of them in order to meet the demands because of the rural um, areas within the UK. We need to think about future planning and optimizing renewable energy generation sources. So as I said, you know, in, encouraging um, rooftop solar panels where um, is going to reduce, so it's not going to impact sort of land area. And we need to consider rapid deployment of emissions and renewable energy technologies to reduce the cumulative environmental impacts. And finally, how do we get people back onto public transport? Thank you. I'll just stop sharing my screen now.